Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our virtual BRAC meeting, Build a Realtor Alliance Committee for today. We have a really interesting and um, very on topic with the current climate uh, meeting topic today. We're going to be talking about NIMBY or not in my backyard to YIMBY or yes in my backyard. And we're going to be discussing some of the challenges and impediments that home builders and developers are running into right now in this current climate that um, could be affecting getting approvals to build new homes and apartment complexes. So we have some really great speakers for today that I'd like to introduce quickly. Uh, we have John Melkai, who is the Executive Director of the Building Industry Association of Central Ohio. And he is heavily involved with uh, legislative advocacy and workforce development. If you're not familiar with the BIA, they have served the Central Ohio Home Building Committee for 75 years. And they represent nearly 800 builders, developers, and associate members. So John joined the BIA in 2017 after seven years as the VP of Government and External Affairs for Heating, Air Conditioning, and Refrigeration Distributors International. He has served on the board of directors for the Family Business Coalition, the Small Business Legislative Council, and is a current board member with the Ohio Society of Associative Executives and a member of the City of Worthington's Visioning Committee. So John graduated from Ohio State and he lives in Worthington with his wife Amanda and daughters Mary and Claire. So we're really excited to hear from John today. And then we also have Brett Swander who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for Columbus Realtors. And he is responsible for advocating the association's public policy agenda, and managing the Central Ohio Realtors and Political Action Committee. So prior to joining Columbus Realtors, Brent worked in state and federal politics for over 10 years. On behalf of former President George W. Bush, he served in the White House, traveling across the world, planning and executing events, promoting the president's policies. It's actually really cool. Uh, he also worked as a media advisor to Congressman Paul Ryan during the Romney-Ryan 2012 campaign and he served on the McCain 2008 campaign and several statewide and congressional campaigns. John, or Brent, I'm sorry, graduated from Bowling Green State University with a bachelor's in sport marketing. And he resides in Dublin with his wife, Lauren, daughter, Peyton, and their two dogs, Wrigley and Hank. So welcome both Brent and John. We're really excited to hear from you today. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And my son, Graham. Oh. I, need, I need to update. I need to update my profile. Sorry, Marque. That's my fault. <laughs> and and this is being recorded, so he's got something to hold over you for uh, the duration of his life. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Paul, for having us. And Marque. Well, by the way, just as an aside, you know, you don't have to be a builder to be in, in the BIA. I've been uh, with them for a little while now, so it is a good way to keep in touch with what's going on and what they're up against. And we can certainly advocate for them, especially in a low inventory kind of market like we are. Uh, you know, they're more than happy to take realtors uh, as part of members. So you guys, it's certainly a good thing to do. Just wanted to say that, John. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And I see Linda Winrod, our membership director, is on the call. So I'm sure she's taking uh, detailed notes on who's logged on and we'll be following up afterwards. And she will. Trust me, she will. <laughs> John, I'll let you take it. Well, first of all, right. I'll, just, I'll just say, John, before you start, I'll just say, before, um, you know, we have always had Columbus Realtors has a long history of a great relationship with the BIA. Um, through the collaboration and work we've done, um, we've always had a great relationship and through under our new leadership with, with John Giha, our new CEO, um, that certainly we're hoping to take that to a new level and, um, and how we share information and collaboratively work together. So I think this is a good first step of many more to come. I will say that. Thank you and uh, completely concur. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us and um, and NIMBY to YIMBY providing homes and opportunities across our region um, is the topic as uh, Mark Hay and Aaron kind of um, indicated and uh, we can probably just jump right into the next slide. I don't know if I have control over this Mark Hay or. Uh... No, but I can give you control. Okay, yeah. Would you prefer to do it that way? 
It doesn't matter to me, whatever's most comfortable for you. Um, I can have you, I can turn it over to you as presenter. Yeah, that'll um, work. But then you'll have to bring the screen, the bring it up on your screen and share it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll let you do that then because I don't want to mess up my computer. <laughs> okay. So central Ohio housing market, you folks are well familiar with it. Um, the good, and there is good news in central Ohio, um, despite uh, all of the activities in the last few months. And that is that population growth is still happening in our region. Um, in contrast with pretty much all other regions across the state of Ohio and counties, we are seeing growth in central Ohio. I think the only thing comparable is southwest Ohio, a little bit in Warren County and up that I-75 corridor. We have the strongest economy in the state, as goes the central Ohio region, goes the state of Ohio. That's because we have a diverse economy, including state of uh, state government, local governments, Ohio State University, medical, retail, insurance, you name it, we have it. That's good for us. And on a more uh, housing related note, our year over year permits are up in the region. We are, um, I, as of this month, year over year, at about 10,000, um, which is a jump from where we have been. That's single and multifamily homes. So there is some good news to have. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows in central Ohio. And there we do face some challenges right now. Um, and and uh, I think Paul alluded to it earlier. The lack of inventory is a major issue, um, both existing homes and new homes. And that has been a major challenge in our um, in our region for some time. Increased costs, and these costs are related to a the lack of inventory two, rise in material costs, and three, delays in the approval process. A big challenge that we have is the availability of future lots um, for construction. Uh, we are moving through a, a, a period of hot construction um, right now, and uh, COVID has not tempered that. In fact, it's increased it substantially. The challenge is we're building through a lot of the lots that are already out there, and because of delays, we're not able to um, to say with certainty that we have enough lots to meet the demands that are in our market um, in the future. And in the last slide, I talked about 10,000 permits. That's great. That's up year over year. We're happy about that. The downside of that is our, we did a housing study a few years ago that said we need anywhere from about 12 to 15,000 homes a year. So we're still two to 5,000 homes um, building less than we should. And John, I'll just uh, we're going to get into this in a little bit, but one of the one of the points here on um, on lack of inventory is we'll talk about social media and the perception of the NIMBYism movement. If if you're on social media, the next door apps, um, a lot of times we see um, there are plenty of homes for sale. We don't need to build more uh, because there are plenty of homes for sale. <clears throat> Um, there's also some aspect about um, the increase, increased costs, um, the regulatory costs that John mentioned, but these all play into the nimbyism attitude um, and the affordability of homes. So as we talk about lack of inventory, um, there's a perfect slide right here. I think John's going to hit on it, but we were at 1.1 months of inventory um, last month when a healthy market is about six or six and a half months. So John, I'll turn it back over to you. But I think as we as we start to think about the nimbyism attitude and you know we always try to keep things positive, but I think we have to literally talk about um, some of the reality of the situation as well. And um, the misinformation, mistruths, half truths that are are um, out there is what we hope to build our ambassadors in and get you all to, to spread the good news uh, as we move forward. Absolutely, and Mark Hay actually moved to the next slide, which is uh, Columbus Realtors does a great job with the uh, um, housing reports on a monthly basis. And you can look right now when listings are down 38.4%, uh, through the month of June, and we were already at a low inventory, um, that poses major problems.
for the region um, in, in long-term construction. Uh, I think we can jump to the next slide. Brent found this slide, so I'll let him dive yes. in a little bit. So we, we hear we always hear these anecdotal stories, or we hear directly from developers that, uh, or we we quite frankly attend the township trustee meetings, um, and they are packed full of anti-development um, mentality. So I did a little bit of research, and while this is directly from three professors at Boston University, um, I think it probably speaks true and would hold true um, here in Central Ohio. So um, I'm quoting a I'm quoting a Boston Globe article um, from 2018, but three Boston University's professors. Um, combed three years worth of meeting minutes from 97 cities and towns in the region. Nearly two thirds of the residents who stood up to speak about proposed housing developments did so to oppose them, while just 14% spoke in support. Um, the people who show up to these meetings are overwhelmingly opposed to construction of new housing in ways that are way out of whack with public opinion, said Catherine Levine, who's a Boston University political science professor. I think those are that speaks to the challenge um, that we have and the pressure that a lot of these public and elected officials are facing when they're sitting behind a dais um, and they're hearing from a developer and oftentimes their attorney and you have residents um, packing seats or a standing crowd they are facing pressure um, from their constituents to stop development back to the lack of inventory which that obviously plays into it john giha john melkai and i were in meetings before pre-covid but yeah. this year um and we were having a long long conversation we were about an hour and a half in and john melkai finally stands up raises his hand and says we've talked a lot about um what we can do to help with the inventory and help with the ha affordable housing housing affordability what we haven't talked about is building a single house um, and there's a lot of nuance that goes into that. So when when we're talking about housing affordability, but we're talking about a growing population, fewer homes on the market, um, those two numbers just don't add up. So we're asking you all to be part of the process. You know, we need help, um, not only from the BIA standpoint, from a realtor standpoint, but it really becomes an economic message. And that's the one thing that we have continuously talked about is working with our other partners, One Columbus, um, the Economic Development Group. And I know, John, we're gonna get into this here in a second, but that NIMBYism mentality is real. And the only people who show up to these township trustee meetings or the zoning meetings, other than the developer and their attorney, are those who oppose it. Uh, these developments and John you you probably have some more insight onto that from a from your membership perspective but I, I can tell you that's what I'm hearing um, from ours from our, our members who are developers absolutely it is um, it is clearly uh, one of the biggest hurdles we have and um, um, Marque, I think if we could move to the next slide um, it'll cover a little bit about this uh, NIMBY succeed because they show up um, and very few people show up in support of new housing and new developments um, for a variety of reasons. Um, now we're starting to see the tide turn. Quite frankly, some of that is on the building, um, the building and, and development community. Um, in the past, we were able to focus on you're trying to get your majority of council or majority of the trustees and that's where you spent the bulk of your time answering concerns now you're trying to move into a almost a full-fledged pr campaign um it, to be inclusive of the neighbors and the communities and that's not something that um, our industry has had to do before um at least not uh, not on the wide scale that we see uh, but there is so much social media out there um and it is so um uh, you know, I, I told uh, Brent, you could see a Facebook group 
and it looks like there's 200 posts, but 200 of them, those posts come from six people or seven people. But it gives the impression that there's huge opposition to a lot of developments. And um, and and to their credit, um, they do the work, and uh, it's going to take a new um, tone for us to succeed. Um, I think we can move to the next slide. Brent, I'll turn this over to yeah. you because you've heard so, them all. Yeah, so these are a lot of the talking points that you either see on social media or that are brought up um, that are brought up at the uh, zoning hearings or the township trustees, county commission hearings, really township trustees, um, because that's where a lot of the development is happening, is overcrowded schools. So if you take Olentangy for an example, Dublin, um, all working on new high schools or trying to find a way to build new high schools, traffic. Uh, and John's gonna talk a little bit about traffic studies and traffic impacts that developers must go through. The character of neighborhoods, we hear this one a lot. Um, the character of, of the neighborhoods, of the communities where they live, um, it's the pr proverbial, um, you know, they are in their development, they are in their neighborhood, but they don't want anyone else around them. Um, and then basic city services, fire and police services. Um, we could spend an entire session on House Bill 920 and how taxes are levied um, from municipalities, even to schools and the impact of House Bill 920 um, from 40 years ago. Uh, but overcrowding of schools, traffic, character of neighborhoods and fire and safety services are the biggest um, talking points and often again there's a lot of positive to talk about so i don't want to talk about the negative too much but the uh the the fear tactics um or the scare tactics that are used uh and there's a lot of research that we could continue to conduct but there's there's some out there and i think john's going to talk a little bit about that as well yep and if we could move to the next slide we'll kind of address those and give people a little talking a few talking points to combat this but and schools, the reality, um, 0.312 kids for every new construction unit built in the state of Ohio, um, that's less than existing homes. So when a new development goes up, and this is ex this is especially um, prevalent discussion when the, the discussion of multifamily and rental units um, happens all the time, it's this is going to overwhelm the schools. That is simply not so. In a 20 unit building multifamily structure, 0 0.076 kids per uh, per unit, um, which is well less than the single family um, existing and new construction markets. I will give you two examples. Um, um, as uh, Erin mentioned when she was reading the bio, I happen to live in Worthington. There are two uh, relatively new apartment complexes within the city of Worthington, school, Worthington City School Districts. Uh, the district on Linworth Avenue, uh, or in the Linworth area, and uh, uh, the Heights by Worthington Mall. Between those two uh, apartments, there are approximately 500, oh, we're moving a little too far ahead. Yep, there we are. Uh, um, approximately four to 500 units and 30 students, and they generate $1.5 million in taxes. You drive along Polaris Parkway, and uh, the superintendent from Olentangy Schools said something along the lines of they, the average um, uh, tax revenue per student out of those apartment complexes is about $25,000, which is well above the cost to educate a student and a, and a net positive. Um, also, a couple of things that I'll throw in regarding this. The school districts exist to serve students. They don't get to determine how much or how many students are in their district. It's something that needs to come up and does come up occasionally. And we've supported school levies from time to time. But in some um, municipalities, we now are seeing um, uh, opposition from the superintendent and school board level. We just can't have these students. That's A, that's not their call. And two, um, most of the facts bear that to be untrue. Um, so those are things to uh, uh, keep in mind as it, as it regards to school. And by the way, the state of Ohio has an, had an unconstitutionally funded school system for more than 20 plus years here in the state. Um, our organization, along with others, has consistently 
urged the state of Ohio to address this issue and our reliance on property taxes for school. Um, we have districts in the state that are criminally and unconstitutionally funded, um, Olin TNG being one of the leaders um, that receive less than they are guaranteed by state government, and um, that needs to be remedied. Um, next slide, please. Traffic. This is a big one. Anytime a new development comes up, well, the traffic, the traffic, the traffic. Developers go to great expense um, to do what is called a traffic study. Um, and in these traffic studies, they will make a recommendation for improvements that need to be made um, to accommodate the new development. Almost every developer will tell you that they have, in the course of, of bringing a new development to, process, to um, fruition, gone above what is legally required to help them. Um, I'll give you an example. I think it was on Wagner Road in Reynoldsburg uh, about a year ago. There was an apartment uh, that was um, going to be built and it got shut down at city council level. The primary concern was traffic. And there was an estimated $10 million cost to improve Wagner Road and the developer was going to put in four million dollars of that the city would have to come up with the remaining six to make all the improvements and they veto the city council um, voted against the project so they got zero and wagner road still needs 10 million dollars to be funded the long and the short of it is a developer is not responsible for fixing years of neglect that communities have made in their roads but I would wager that the building and development community across central Ohio has put more money into funding infrastructure improvements than anybody but the federal and state government. Next slide, please. Here's my favorite one, character of the communities. Um, and uh, I put this, uh, I put Chip and Joanna's picture on there because every township trustee and uh, village trustee and city council member um, now thinks they're Chip and Joanna because they've watched HGTV too much. And what they do is they put in place um, certain requirements, whether they're called um, residential design standards, um, which dictate the way a home must look and the materials that must be used. Um, and Pataskill and Canal Winchester are two recent examples of this. Um, Canal Winchester put into place residential design standards um, a little more than a year ago. Since that time, I don't believe anything in the city limits proper has moved um, as far as new developments. And the design standards that they were putting in, we estimated that they were going to cost um, uh, the average home could not be built for less or sold for less than $400,000. The market in Canal Winchester for new construction was at about 315, 320 at the time. That's an $80,000 jump in base price. And when you asked, where did you get these standards from? The answer was, we copied them from Dublin in some community outside of Washington, DC. And uh, what it does, it could be as simple as, we're going to mandate this type of vining. The vinyl standards in Pataskala and Canal Winchester are more stringent than those in Dublin. They also make mandates such as you can't put a garage, a garage needs to be set back four feet from uh, the front of the house. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense uh, in many cases. And uh, we've had many parade of home houses where that was not the case. But these are mandates that people see on drawings and they say that they want. And they do this in the name of architectural diversity, but it has the reverse effect of making everything look exactly the same and um, they'll dictate which models can be built. Maybe there's MI Homes comes up with an, a, a really great model and floor plan that people like. According to these design standards, you can't have the same model house next to each other in many of these communities. So that's, a, that's, a, that's one example. The other is the densities, um, you know, that um, uh, the, the belief that the way the community looks today, it should always look. And uh, across central Ohio, that hasn't been the case. And, uh, you know, we're a developing and evolving community. We need to, communities should make sure that their components of their heritage are being, um, are being maintained. Um, but it, oftentimes this is done and the homeowner gets no benefit of this. It raises the cost and makes the community more exclusionary. 
Um, Brent, I'll turn it over to you because I know you have a few examples from some of these fun places. Yeah, so we can talk about um, several of these where uh, John just talked about traffic and design standards. And when we talk about affordability, um, BIA had a golf outing a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to a developer there and said, uh, quite frankly, a lot of these municipalities are getting more and more greedy um, and asking us to pay for everything. And quite frankly, at that point, at a, you reach a certain point where you can't make the pro formas work, um, whether it's traffic, whether it's design standards, et cetera. <clears throat> to John's point about density and going through the process, developers often go through, not often, they go through a multi-tiered process. Um, it usually starts with the zoning process and into the township trustees or council. Um, and there are a couple, instances here where the developers are doing everything that they are being asked to do and then you also turn around and see citizens initiating ballot petitions um, signature petitions to overturn the development at the ballot one of those cases is in pal uh, many of you might remember that um, there was a project in pal that was approved and overturned and it ended up costing the city of Powell, $1.8 million. The city paid $950,000 out of their general revenue fund and 850,000 was paid by Great American Insurance. Another case of anti-development is in Grandview. Uh, I believe this was 2017 in which we actually helped um, fund um, the, the opposition. Uh, there was a ballot initiative to change the setback from 100 feet uh, to 200 feet. They wanted to double the setback in Grandview simply to stop a development in a lot split. Um, and it was a ballot, ballot initiative actually between two streets on north of Goodale Boulevard. Um, it was very specific to help to stop development. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple other examples where we got involved um, from an association standpoint. There was a um, issue called the Columbus Community Bill of Rights. And it was really they were talking about fracking, anti-fracking, um, et cetera. Well, the last time I checked, there isn't a whole lot of fracking going on in the city of Columbus. Um, but what it really was, was an anti-development measure um, that was going to be sent to the ballot for um, the citizens to vote on. And what this would have done is given, given um, non-living or uh, organisms the uh rights of people so a person could actually sue on behalf of a frog or a displaced uh piece of dirt or rocks and when you hear this you think brent you're crazy that's actually not could not have happened and it would have it would have given um people the right to sue on behalf of um these entities i don't know if i want to use the word entities um, to stop development. It was all intended to be an anti-development measure uh, to hold up the process. So yes, John Melkai could have sued um, on behalf of a displaced frog or tree or water uh, to stop development. So when we talk about NIMBYism being real, NIMBYism is real. Um, and these are the issues that we are advocating on daily, working with um, our partners and, and just helping to inform you all so you can help spread the message as well. Um, a lot of advocacy work goes into this um, from a multitude of organizations, not just the two of our, just not, not just the BIA and, and the realtors as well. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll even echo a little bit more of, of what Brent just said, which is, we hear oftentimes in our country about political divide and um, you know there's red red states blue states red parts of central ohio blue parts of central ohio the number one thing that the most red parts of columbus and the most blue part or uh, blue parts of uh, columbus and red parts of delaware county agree on is nimbyism and the challenges that the development community faces in uh, whether it's the Near East Side or Clintonville are very similar to those that they face in um, Etna Township, Johnstown, and uh, Berlin Township. And uh, it, it's, it, 
it it is very real. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to add too on on the character of the communities, we we talk a lot about density, um, and the challenge that we have in Central Ohio is, and we talk often about housing affordability. Mm -hmm. With the lot mandates and the size mandates that many of these communities place upon the builder, it, you simply cannot build more affordable housing when lots are mandated to be a third of an acre or a half an acre or even more. And um, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a number of great builders in central Ohio. Um, I, I took something from uh, Bobby Schottenstein at MI Homes where he called and they're in multiple markets. And he called Columbus the side yard capital of America because nowhere else does MI build homes where they are mandated to put in side yards uh, uh, like they are in central Ohio. I don't know how many of you guys like your side yards. I can never really figure out what to do with it. Um, it just takes time when I mow and then I got to water the grass and I'm irritated because I'm watering my neighbors. And I feel like I'm wasting water, but um, the lot, the size of the lots are a big challenge and there is no equation between the size of a lot and the value of a house. You know this better than anybody in this audience does it. So being able to take that sort of information to local governments is going to be uh, crucial moving forward. John, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the pig farm in Genoa Township. I'll let you have that one. Yeah. We, um, although he's a joint, the, the developer was a joint member, so but I'll let yes. you have that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, um, uh, I think uh, many of you know Ben, ben Alcazar owned a property in, um, in Genoa Township. Um, had actually lived on the land for um, 10 plus years and um, was going to develop it. Um, I believe it was 46, 43 homes on 46 acres. Uh, Romanelli and Hughes was to build. Um, Benton was actually going to move into one of those. The township trustees approved it. It was then overturned overwhelmingly at um, the levy uh, or at the ballot box. Um, Benton had said that if it, uh, you know, if he couldn't do it, he was going to get a, um, a turn it into a pig farm, which he was legally allowed to do. Um, and they called that high density development. And uh, what ended up happening, I believe there's a, there was a settlement at uh, federal court um, and uh, Benton's going to be able to do his development now. And it all it did was cost the township money. Um, he had every right to do it. He was within all of the juris the code that they had laid out. And it was going to be a good development. And uh, they called uh, more than one house per acre high density. And uh, oftentimes we're dealing with people who are not um, uh, dealing honestly with facts. And I think that's a big takeaway for you all as um, participants today is we are seeing more and more of this. A developer is adhering to every mandate that they have to. And when something is passed, we are seeing more and more ballot referendums. Uh, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have yet to see where one of those ballot referendums hasn't ended up in federal court and the developer has won, or at least they've settled and have moved forward. Um, and, it, and it ends up costing the municipality or township hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's no recourse for these folks to circulate petitions and put something on the ballot. And the state of Ohio and the Supreme Court in the state of Ohio has been very, um, um, has given wide leeway to ballot initiatives. So the, um, Brent mentioned the issue in Powell. That issue should have never been allowed on the ballot in the first place. And, um, but that's kind of the way the state rolls. And, uh, you know, $1.8 million later, Powell had a tax increase. Um, because they had to pay for this. So this is a definite challenge um, that um, uh, many developments face and it factors into the cost because they can't get approved funding and they can't begin until the referendum period is over because no bank is going to release a bunch of funds for construction if there's a ballot referendum. The only thing this does is increase cost over time. I think we've got a, the next slide, please. Thank you. And this is one thing that I think our entire industry um, 
needs to champion. And Brent talked about the challenge of services and that, uh, you know, this is going to tax services. The reality of what we do is a, is a residential construction industry. And this includes everybody from um, uh, the realtor who, who brokered the land deal um, all the way through the closing and the title agents. For every single family home constructed of an average cost, 2.9 jobs are created and supported for a year for ev just one home. And when you think of, um, I think Pulte has a development pending on the west side of Columbus that's about a thousand units um, total. Think about that, what that means um, and the number of jobs that that supports for our industry. And it generates about $130,000 in tax revenue per single family home. And that's income tax generated by the jobs there, sales tax generated, property tax generated. Those are big numbers. Same for multifamily, 1.25 jobs, $55,000 in, in tax revenue per unit. And even on the remodeling side, and I think we're going to start seeing this even more and more. Because of the lack of inventory within central Ohio, more and more people are going to buy an existing home and either tear it down and rebuild it or do a complete gut job remodeling. And um, there's objections to what that will look like um, by neighbors um, oftentimes. And uh, I think Upper Arlington has probably been the, the bourbon community where we've seen more teardowns and rebuilds um, recently, but I think that's going to continue to move um, throughout our city and, and something to, to be aware of as you're um, working with clients uh, moving forward. There are opportunities for teardowns and rebuilds, and there are builders who really, that's what they do, and they're part of that market. I think we're going to see more and more of that. A lot of BIA members, because they cannot get enough lots in other areas, they're looking to infill projects to do. But I, I wanna make sure everybody thinks about this. Our industry supports more than 20,000 jobs, full-time jobs in central Ohio um, any, on a yearly basis. And that puts, and that's just the residential side of the coin. That's not looking at um, the commercial side as well, which also generates a ton of jobs. Construction is a big part of what we do. So in these communities, you hear, we want jobs. We want, well, these are good jobs. It takes a lot of people in a lot of different industries to be bring a housing development to the forefront. We need to champion that in these hearings and say, listen, um, that supply house that's on the, uh, in our town is going to sell a lot of uh, a lot of supplies to build these homes. That paint store is going to sell a lot of paint because of these homes that are being built. We need to champion all of the jobs. You know, if you're in your local community to be able to say, I'm going to be involved in selling, you know, helping to sell these homes, it's going to generate tax dollars for the city. Um, and so many times people make the mistake of thinking that if we build a new development and it's a hundred houses that a hundred new people are going to just move in and they don't think that anybody existing within that community wants to move into those homes um, i think about um, grove city i was in a, uh, a meeting with uh, mayor stage who talked about one of the first condominium complexes that they did in in grove city where they were said, well, nobody's going to move into those condos. And he said, by the time they were done, 83% of the condo units had been occupied by uh, previous Gro Grove City residents who wanted a different option. So housing, uh, diversity of housing stock is something that people want within a community, and it has a, a great economic impact to what we're doing. We're an important industry. We need to champion that in these meetings because economic development is something that all communities understand. I think we can move to the next slide. Yep. And we do have, we have some great partners. We've worked well, um, not only with BIA, uh, but when we talk, talk about housing, I think um, we often overlook the Apartment Association and we should not. We, as the BIA Columbus Realtors and Apartment Association, um, used to have a, uh, I'll call a loose coalition uh, called the shelter, the shelter coalition. And it's something that we are working to bring back. We will bring back, um, 
for instance, we'll talk about um, two, two years ago or a year ago, maybe we were sitting in our CORPAC governing board candidate interviews, and we had a candidate literally pounding his fists on the table saying he would never vote for another apartment complex in his community if he were elected to council. Um, so we do have some great partnerships. We have a great process here, uh, but Morpsey is in the middle of a regional housing study, which we are all involved in. Um, I'm very hopeful for some of the recommendations that are going to come out of that. Um, part of it candidly makes me a little nervous too, um, but the idea is to help shape some public policy um, recommendations for Central Ohio as we move forward with um, our regional housing study and, and dealing with some of the NIMBYism mentalities. Uh, we do have some great partners, uh, like, like John said, in city municipalities, Mayor Stage and, and uh, Grove City is, has been great. Mayor Maggard, Kim Maggard in Whitehall has been great. Um, but there are some obstacles. We've seen or heard conversations of specific council members from around Central Ohio, not necessarily in Columbus, but in some of the suburban areas that they wanna issue six month moratoriums on all new development. We have seen one municipality actually issue a moratorium. So there are um, some obstacles, there's some hope, but we have great resources um, with Morpsey. Uh, Mode is, are the uh, economic development directors, the Central Ohio Economic Development Directors, BIA, obviously uh, the realtors and one Columbus. And as we talk about often, our message needs to be one of that of economic development and jobs. Um, Central Ohio continues to grow because it is a desirable area. Cost of living, great jobs, a great workforce. Uh, it's, it's very desirable, uh, not to mention the great restaurants and uh, sports that we have here, but it needs to be one of economic development um, and, and jobs. So these are some of the partners, not all of them, um, as we move forward and, and, and resources that we have. And lastly, I think um, John chime in here, but you know, what, what we want you all to take away from today are some of the obstacles, uh, a message of hope, knowing that there is a certain reality um, that our region faces that quite frankly, our developers face. Um, but we need, or we're asking you to be ambassadors. Um, to help spread the message. And Columbus Realtors, while it's not an official written policy, has never been pro-development. We are pro-responsible development. Um, everything has to come with smart growth. Um, reasonable, responsible, um, level-headed development. And we're asking you to help join in that cause. Because as Inventory continues to plummet currently. Um, prices continue to rise. We have a housing inventory problem. Uh, yes, we have other problems and other issues as well, but we currently have a housing inventory problem. So, you know, I think we called this part one because we're hopeful that we can continue. Now, we're, we're not hopeful. We will continue these conversations. Um, and conversations will turn into actions. And we will lead the way um, with your help as we build ambassadors and advocates um, to, to help in our cause. So John, I'll turn it back over to you. But I think uh, the last point I'll mention quickly um, is what we do on an advocacy level to help uh, elect great elected officials. Um, and a lot of those decision makers, I, very, I draw a very clear distinction between public and elected because a lot of the decision makers, quite frankly, are unelected. Um, and then some of those decisions ultimately always get to the elected officials. But when you're talking about um, zoning, BZA, um, uh, and some of these other organizations, the area commissions, et cetera, aren't necessarily elected. So uh, public and elected officials are vital, um, great relationships and, and telling our story. That's something we have to be willing to do is tell our story. Yeah, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more, um, and I, I, 
I think about it is, is what Brent said. This hopefully is the first of a handful of these discussions that we get to have because, you know, as we were trying to figure out how to put this into about a 45 minute or 40 minute to 50 minute presentation and be able to take some questions, there are issues that I'm sure you, some of you may have related to the environment and sustainability, related to equity um, and, um, and, and having a more um, uh, equitable society. Uh, but these are a handful of the the issues that we see and, and hopefully this primer can help us out, but I think standing up and speaking out is important. Over the last few months, I think we've realized a few things. Um, a home isn't just where you go to at night. A home is, um, is in, in some cases over the last few months where you're educating your kids, um, where you're worshiping, um, where you're working out and exercising or maybe skipping the workout if you're like me, um, uh, where you're spending time with your loved ones and, and you're realizing how much, um, how much that means to you. What our industry does is provide that to people and that is important. And that is the fabric of what makes up a community. A community is not made up by, boy, this building looks great, as much as you know, we love great architecture. A building is made up of the people that live, or a community is made up of the people that live within it. We're fortunate in Central Ohio that we have a region and a community that people wanna be in. We need to be welcoming and inclusive and provide housing and opportunity for all. And, um, that doesn't mean that we can build just one type of house or sell one type of house and that's gonna solve the issue. We need to build more homes and to provide more opportunity for everybody who wants to live in our region and who wants a great job in the residential um, construction real estate industry. So um, with that, I think we can take some questions and uh, I wanna make sure I think our contact information is on the last slide. You should always feel free to contact either Brent or myself or um, John um, or anyone else uh, in our organization, they can put you in contact with me. Um, if you're, if there's a meeting at your city council and you want information, or if you have questions on maybe what the best strategy is, I want to make myself available um, to you folks as well. And I will be telling our building and development folks they need to be reaching out to the real estate community at large and finding allies within communities because the. I think the reality is you folks know more people in your communities oftentimes than the developer who's just showing up and can help help them um, through the process as well. So there's a couple of questions in the chat um, uh, specific to uh, housing affordability and affordable housing. Uh, there's one on the new, Leslie's asking the current uh, vacancy rates on the new apartment complexes. I don't have any hard numbers on those. I can see if we can find some hard data from the BIA. Um, anecdotally, um, again, not a hard data, but I've heard some of our folks uh, here in the realtor community who are building multi-unit multi, um, multi -unit, uh, apartment complexes say that they have 90 to 95% occupancy. Um, it is very high. And that's why we obviously continue to see um, to see more and more apartments being built. There is a demand. There continues to be a demand. Uh, the BIA has done a number of studies. We've been involved in a couple of those, um, providing data, et cetera. But um, the we need to continue to build build those units. Yeah, um, we. Uh, oh, sorry, Brent. I was going to say we in our housing study we projected the need for. And this is a couple years back, 457,000 housing units. The vast majority of those were going to be rent or need to be rental units in our market uh, is the projection, uh, like 52% of those. Now, those could be single family rentals, which is um, the single family rental market is probably one of the fastest growing segments of, of that um, community. But um, there's definitely a need and and. To Brent's point earlier, um, uh, so far vacancy rates haven't been, um, ha we've not seen a, a massive um, um, flooding of evictions and, and losses. And I think that's due to uh, 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 the CARES Act and, and resources that were provided to um, unemployed and um, um, folks who've had their hours cut. Um, I also think that the real estate industry learned many lessons from 
the Great Recession and adapted quickly and immediately started working with their tenants and being proactive. And I think that's a good thing um, for the industry. John, I'll let you take this one. I'll read it for you, but uh, we can piggyback here. Um, NIMBY has been going on for years, but look at all the development that has passed. It's a give and take. Developers do have to give community perks in order to be held to higher standards. How else would you suggest doing this? Well, I guess I, I think, yeah, it's a give and take. And I think most developers and builders are, are really uh, willing to to do that. Um, I, I, I guess I'd counter by saying there's a lot of communities that have NIMBYed their way out of out of um, out of seeing new developments. Um, if you look at the vast majority of um, the single family construction market in central Ohio um, right now, um, it is dominated uh, by national and regional builders. Um, and we're fortunate to have a couple of those folks that are, are, are headquartered here. Uh, but I say that because money's fungible. And they can, they money's money can move, and these are national builders, and they're going to move their money where they can get a project off the ground and get um, investment done. There used to be a time when all building, the vast majority of building, was done locally, and uh, that's just not the case anymore. And large developers, if they don't think that they can get a return on their investment, they'll take it somewhere else. And we know that our costs of development are higher here in central Ohio than they are um, elsewhere. So, um, of course, there's a give and take, um, but there is, uh, I, and I've talked to people in, in some local governments who didn't, don't believe that, you know, they think that the project will always happen. And I, I just don't know that that's the case. And I fear what happens if you keep pushing too much for too long. I think a lot of communities could find themselves on the outside looking in. John, from your experience, here's a question. Are the lot size mandates um, the reason no one, well, let me, I'll read it. Is, is this why no one wants to build in the inner city due to lot size mandates? I believe builders should be in the inner city as well and not just on the outskirts of 270 and beyond. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, I think there's a variety of reasons of why infill development hasn't happened. Um, um, at the pace that maybe people would like. I think a lot of it is economies of scale. Um, mm -hmm. And it, can a builder get a large enough parcel um, of land to do a, a do a development? I think Westport DR Horton has one on the south uh, east side of Columbus that's that's done pretty well. Um, that's not, and that's inside the outer belt. Um, uh, I'll be honest, the city of Columbus is challenging to work with on subdivision developments. They don't do a lot of them anymore. So it has become, because they don't do them as regularly, it's become a little bit of a challenge. Um, but I think that, uh, I don't think it's lot size as much as it is economies of scale and can people get um, a large enough um, chunk of land to where they could uh, really make the numbers work. Um, we've talked a lot with Morpsey and other folks who, you know, there are there are land bank properties in other areas where you can go around, but it's, uh, you know, onesie twosie and you're a couple blocks away and it's not, it's just a different business model than going into a development where you can go one house, next house, next house, next house. So I think creative uh, builders and developers are going to be looking at it, um, uh, but it's, it's um, you got to make the math work. And I don't know that some of the large um, single family traditional builders, if that fits into the business model, although Fisher Homes is now doing something, um, land acquisition and infill inside cities. In terms of affordability, uh, Sharon, I think to your question, and there's several of you, I'm not, on, I don't regularly attend the affordable housing uh, committee meetings, but it's I believe we from Columbus Realtors actually raised that standard from 150 to 180, correct me if I'm wrong, um, several years ago. Um, you know, really it's at 30% um, of its family, of a family income. But I don't know if you guys have a definition that you use, John. I think we went from 150 to 180, if, if somebody can correct me on that. Um, but, but we've talked a lot about the, the reasons why um 
why these costs continue to rise. It's economics 101, supply and demand. It's increased regulatory costs. It is developers who are doing way more than, than required um, and they're trying to make pro formas work and they have to, um, they have to continue um, to, to raise prices. And it's just the unfortunate reality of the situation. And um, I guess I'll let John take it from there. No, it's interesting. I think Franklin County, the commissioners approved um, support of affordable housing homes um, uh, recently. And in order to make the numbers work, they had to give each home essentially $100,000 to knock off the price of the builder because the, it, it wasn't as if the construction was um, being, um, uh, you know, that they were, the builder was pocketing a lot of money at, at cost. I think they were looking at a $200,000 house plus and, um, you know, the commissioners kicked in 100 something to make it fit that affordable, um, affordable range. And you know, talk with uh, uh, Bruce Lukey from Homeport is on our board of trustees at the BIA, and he's talked about this often. You know, the challenges that even Homeport has um, in in constructing a home uh, in a quality house um, that um, is suitable and can be uh, without support for affordable um, that fits that affordable range. It's it's a real challenge right now, and all those costs add up, um, and um, what we've asked local governments is to try to make the processes a little more smooth. And if we can make up some efficiencies there, then hopefully we won't need abatements. We won't need um, government uh, um, um, subsidy to, to make um, housing affordability um, a reality. I, I would urge everybody, if you have the, if you're really bored at night, um, look at the Houston, um, Texas metro market. They have very few land use regulations in Houston, Texas, um, and it's a booming area. And you look at the average cost for house there versus all across the country, including in Dallas and other markets. And because they have liberalized their land use policies, and um, they have been able to make um, housing much more accessible for people in what is a booming city. Um, and if you've ever been to Houston, it just goes on and on and on. Um, and they found that once they reduced their lot size burden or mandates that it that it increased even more. So there are opportunities. Um, uh, I, I know we're bumping up against the hour here, so I'll, I'll leave you with um, this. In many ways in central Ohio, we have first world problems um, compared to the rest of our state. Um, and you look at um, other areas, whether they're Youngstown or Toledo, um, Canton, um, and uh, Dayton, and they wished that they had the challenges that we had. Um, um, uh, so we are fortunate in that there is demand here, um, but it is um, it is a challenge uh, that we need to face together. Um, and responsible growth, we're all in favor of. Um, I, I would sit here and say that every housing development that a builder pitches is the greatest thing on on the planet. Um, I think they need to. Um, to work with the communities that they're going to work in, but we need to make our voices heard collectively as an industry about the importance of housing and what we bring to the table. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you folks today, and uh, look forward to a continued partnership with uh, uh, with Columbus Realtors and and with uh, BRAC moving forward. And um, again, I just appreciate it, and I hope you folks will reach out to me as you have questions. And in, in closing, I would just quickly say, Tim Taylor, I hear your message about um, communities will suffer if they don't become more accepting. Um, they don't care. Um, and Sharon, I think you just had a comment about um, the segment of the population. So with that, I would leave you with, know that this is part one. We, we have had some conversations. Uh, there is a vision for where this can go and additional conversations and those conversations will hopefully turn it, will turn into actions. Uh, because there's a lot more to take away from this um, as we work with our economic development officials, um, our public and elected um, leaders, and where our voices could, can hopefully lend an, lend an ear um, and make a difference. So this is part one of what we hope to become a series um, and address some of these continuing concerns because there's a lot of work to be done, but there is a lot of hope moving forward.
Yeah, and since the Buckeyes aren't playing this fall, you guys can spend all your time going to city council meetings. <laughs> <laughs> this was very informative. Um, we are going to do more, and we will keep you all informed as we put together some additional programming and come up with part two in terms of moving this conversation along and um, and helping our communities to understand why development is good 